So good morning. Um, I would like to welcome you to this uh, panel today, um, which is devoted to enhance cooperation, a way to strengthen regional confidence building and reconciliation. Uh, my name is Florian Bieber. I'm a professor for Southeast European history and politics at the University of Graz, and I coordinate the Balkans and Europe Policy Advisory Group. And for our panel today, we have three excellent panelists who will uh, share their insights and experience with us in our conversation. But before I introduce them, just let me briefly walk you through the way we're going to be having this conversation this morning. We want to have an, an interactive discussion, so you're able to uh, provide your questions in the questions and answer uh, option of the, of the Zoom function. So you can write your questions in there uh, or comments. I will pick them up and uh, put them to our panelists in the course of our conversation over the next hour. You can also like questions of somebody else, but please make the questions as concise as possible so that they are answerable in less than an hour for uh, our panelists. Um, you can also have a chat um, in the chat, but that's really for chat and links, but not for, for questions. You could also ask questions in person. We actually like that because then we can see human beings beyond our three panelists, and that's great. So the, for that, please use your raise your hand function, and then I will call upon you to ask your question. Again, for that, please be as concise and brief as possible, so we really can bring as much uh, experience into this conversation. So um, we have three panelists um, today, as I've mentioned, we're going to go in the order um, it's been announced. Uh, so we're going to start with Exona Bokshi, who is a project officer at the Empowering Youth for a Peaceful, Prosperous and Sustainable Future in Kosovo uh, project. Uh, it's part of the UN Secretary General's Peace Building Fund, and she's uh, a youth activist um, for, for a number of years. Um, and then we have Natasha Kandic, who needs not much of an introduction. She's the coordinator of the Recom Reconciliation Network, long time director of the Humanitarian Law Center and one of the most outstanding human rights activists uh, in uh, the region um, for uh, the last decades. And then finally, uh, we have Frank Moravievitz, who is a special envoy for Southeastern Europe of the Franco-German Youth Office, also familiar to most uh, in the region. He's been doing this task for 20 years now. He himself hails from the German Franco border region has in a certain way a very personal history in the question of uh, reconciliation and dealing with the past from the Franco German perspective. So we, we decided that we're going to go with a couple of rounds of first starting off the conversation and I'm going to ask all three of you for your sense because the question is really how can we uh, improve regional uh, confidence building and reconciliation and the starting point of course is that we are not we're having this conversation because we're not standing at as I think where we would like to see developments in the region, um, especially at the political level. We are often seeing hate speech in media by politicians. Uh, tensions are being fueled sometimes deliberately um, for politicians to score points. Uh, and uh, these tensions are part of domestic debates as well as regional debates. And they exist in parallel to um, the, the many formats in which the leaders of the region meet uh, at uh, workshops, conferences, and so on. Yet at the same time, they also seem to be often willing to stroke the flames of tension. Um, so how do we deal with this? And I think the first round is really to see is what are the kind of concrete things which you think would be important to focus on to advance this process? What, what should be done? What are the kind of three most important uh, most important steps one could undertake to really uh, move this process of, uh, you know, regional confidence building um, and this difficult word of reconciliation uh, forward. So let's start with uh, Exona. What is your, what is your take on this? And I know this is a difficult question and one which we cannot probably answer comprehensively, but just to get the ball rolling. So please go ahead. Yeah, exactly. Like these. $1 million questions, what, what we somehow don't know exactly the, the correct answer. Uh, first, thank you for, for inviting me here. It's it's a privilege for me to to share the this this discussion with uh, uh, Mrs. Natasha Kandic and, and, and Frank, which I was so lucky to to have worked in, in some, some projects um, here in the region. Uh, well, when it comes to when it comes to to, to reconciliation and, and these peace building processes, I think somehow the region in the region we we have done some work, but as you said in in your in your introduction, there is a lot to be done in 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 the process. Uh, I was um, 
For more than three years, I was able to work in a project that was working in, in a peace building and reconciliation here in, in, in Kosovo. And uh, with the main focus uh, on, on youth and, and young people here in, in Kosovo, but not only as well in the region. Uh, what I have seen in the ground and what I have experienced is, is unfortunately not, not really not really easy process when it comes to when it comes to peace building and, and this process of reconciliation. Uh, I have witnessed uh, uh, young people who unfortunately were more nationalists than probably older generations, which I it was something that I never occurred to happen because I was always thinking that, OK, being young, maybe it's it's something that you should think more in a in a in a progressive way. But that is not something that is not something that I have I have witnessed. Uh, I think uh, when it comes to to peace building and, and reconciliation, it there is no timeline, there is no expiration date, and there is no deadline. Like it's 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 a process that you have. There is no starting point on it. I'm, you need investments all the time to do it. So I think uh, and and there is no quick fixes about that. Uh, and but. That is not something that I have seen in, in, in the region, uh, especially in the years that I was working in, in, in this. Uh, what I have seen is, especially in the political level, I have seen a lot of uh, language and a lot of narratives which are not helping that process. Somehow they are, are, are shifting the narrative of, of more democracy into more narratives of, of nationalism, which is not is not helping the, the reconciliation process. As I said, uh, as I said, this reconciliation is not a process when when you have a, a, a timeline. It it starts in, in in different angles. It starts with young people, with politicians. So you don't have only one level that is going on. Uh, what I have seen, unfortunately, I I'm talking here from. I'm speaking to you from Kosovo, and for example, I can take the situation of uh, of the of, for example, the dialogue between Kosovo and, and and Serbia. That is is a that is a process still going on. But what we can see it's it's somehow a conversation, a dialogue without any principles. And you can see that there is not much things that are changing, and there are not actually human life that are, that are changing. So I think. In the region, there's a lot to be done when it comes to when it comes to that. There's a lot of things that that needs to needs to be addressed on on this. Uh, and uh, I I have witnessed. It's it's funny because I have witnessed a lot in in the region and especially in these discussions. Every time we we have, I I am part of that. Somehow all the all the panelists are 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 turning around to young people and saying, oh, okay, like. We look up to you and you should fix everything. And then somehow when I'm on the ground, unfortunately, I see as well young people being nationalists. And then somehow they are saying, oh, there is only young people who can fix this. But then uh, like all all that is going on, it should it should be upon upon the future. I don't think that is the answer. Looking only for the future, for the fix for the things to be fixed. And for for the process of reconciliation to go on, I don't think that is that is what what it takes. You need you need to start now, which I don't think we have actually we have actually done. And what I have seen as well is that what we are doing in, in young people, we are not communicating a lot when it comes to 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 reconciliation. I have witnessed a lot that uh when when we speak about peace somehow we are only saying oh this is a sensitive topic uh when we speak about peace as as it is sensitive to speak about it and I, I don't think that will help the region we should not speak about peace as a sensitive topic of course reconciliation is sensitive because the situation in the region is agitated but we should not learn especially young generation generations and the ones that are now that this peace is um uh, is a uh, is sensitive topic. If we are speaking in that language, we are not helping a lot this this process of, process of, of reconciliation and, and peace building. That is my like my mm -hmm. two words and then we can talk for more. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Exona, for kicking us off into this conversation. So so let's let's see what Natasha, what is your in a certain way? Um, do you do you 
see some parallels and what would be the kind of three most important uh, initiatives or things one could do from your perspective? You just have to unmute, I'm sorry, you just have to unmute your microphone. That's... On the bottom left, there's the unmute button, which should work. Yes, now, it, now it's good. Great, thanks. Uh, in my view, the situation in whole region, uh, not only region calling uh, Western Balkan, but uh, uh, whole territory of the former uh, Yugoslavia is faced to it uh, uh, with lack of political uh, will, domestic politicians, lack of uh, uh, political support uh, of European Union and lack of understanding that uh, time of uh, post-conflict post time is so important, uh, uh, you know, so important to end uh, uh, to uh, end or to uh, make some progress in uh, dealing with past. And then uh, uh, now we have the new priorities, uh, uh, having in mind that uh, 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 the witness that uh, uh, regional politicians in the region, uh, um, you know, they saw uh, um, end of uh, ICTY as, uh, as, you know, a good sign to stop to deal with past. And European Union, um, witness that, but without any reaction. Also, policy of conditionality was very successful uh, many years. Uh, we saw, uh, we saw uh, you know, effort of domestic politicians in uh, 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 trying to have a jurisdiction for domestic trials, but after closing the ICTY, everything uh, is uh, stopped. Uh, uh, there are no, in the region, there are no agenda with the uh, reconciliation issue, with uh, confidence building, uh, uh, how to uh, communicate uh, with others, how to commemorate uh, some very difficult uh, uh, days of the past. And what is most, uh, uh, most important at the moment, how to find solution, how to find exit, how to uh, convince European Union that now is time uh, uh, to show uh, external uh, political support, not only to give uh, money for the some projects and uh, you know to uh, uh, to put in charge some uh, program officers who will monitor implementation of the projects. Uh, it's not issue of the projects. Uh, it's difficult. It's a completely different issue. Uh, some. Uh, regional civil society initiatives were very good. RECOM is very good initiatives, but it was, it was only on the level of uh, financial European Union support uh, without understanding that, uh, uh, the, that the first step to work with uh, leaders from uh, post-Yugoslav countries is to oblige them you know, to name the victims. 130,000 victims uh, with, uh, until date, we don't know their names. It was, it was the first step, and now it is the first step. And without that, uh, we cannot speak about reconciliation. We cannot speak uh, speak how to use um, a legacy of ICTY because uh, uh, ICTY is dead in the region. Nobody mentioned ICTY. Mm -hmm. Data collection are the on the website of ICTY and some. Uh, non, uh, NGOs organization without implementation, without using data, data uh, evidence established by the uh, ICTY. It is the mo uh, most important issue to discuss about that and to see uh, what is common in the region, what is so difficult 
to uh, to put together and how to deal uh, further because uh, uh, we are obliged uh, to uh, obliged uh, to the victims to the young generation you know to do it something today and to create conditions uh, for the future to work to, uh, uh, to, to work forever with the issue of reconciliation and how to build the confidence in the region. Mm -hmm. Thanks, thanks, Natasha. Um, so um, let's turn to Frank to hear uh, his take from, from his experience of what could, well, I guess we've heard a lot actually already about what the problems are, not so much of what are the main initiatives. Well, I'll come back to that about all of, to all of you. Uh, I mean, Natasha's mentioned the Recom, but I want to also kind of tease out some other potential venues of dealing with these uh, questions. But let's maybe first then turn to the problems, because this is something which we've kind of immediately fell into. And let's uh, round that off. So Frank, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, first of all, for the invitation for this excellent panel and hello to all of you. Uh, how to improve reconciliation and regional confidence building. I think, first of all, and I underline what uh, Natasha Kandic already said, uh, we need a political will, a clear political will and support. Um, this is really essential uh, to, to open a new chapter in the relations between the countries in the region and to deal with to, to deal with the past. Um, there is a good example, you know, that I'm working for Franco-German Youth Office, and this is was founded in 1963 to promote the meeting of and dialogue of young of the young generation from France and Germany, and also to overcome the so-called hereditary enemy between Germany and France. So um, this treaty uh, in, the, in the frame of the Elysee Treaty um, and also with the Treaty of Aachen from 2019 still is the ground of the relations between France and Germany. But this treaty would be unthinkable without clear political will, uh, 1963 from the Golden Adenau to say we have to overcome this hereditary enemy, we have to put a new quality in our relations and we have to establish a new dialogue. So uh, civil society plays a very important role until, I mean, in the Franco-German relations, uh, it's, a, it's a key factor, but without a clear political will and support from the governments, I think it's uh, difficult. Uh, then uh, a second point, which is important is, uh, I think to, when we think about reconciliation, is uh, to think reconciliation together with dealing with the past. Uh, I, I would like to give you also, to mention you maybe a difficult example, and I come back on the Franco-German Youth Office. Uh, the Franco-German Youth Office was created in 1963, but a real dialogue about the difficult history, the painful history between France and Germany only started in the 80s. Until then, means in the first 20, 25 years, uh, that was a little bit the behavior to say, okay, let's look in the future. That's what Exona just uh, mentioned. Uh, let's have a look in the future. Let's speak about the future, not about the difficult past. And then in the eighties, uh, somehow there was a political discussion and they waked up and said, okay, it's not possible. We need to speak, we need to face history. We need to speak about the past and uh, also about the painful past and God thanks, it changed in the 70s and the 80s. Uh, and I think uh, we can learn from, from such differences. Uh, RICO, for example, is a good example. Uh, from the very beginning, remembrance work and the topic, topic of reconciliation have, has had an important place in RICO's uh, programs. And it's to be hoped that RICO will maintain uh, this and set a good example here. Um, so um, a third point I would mention is uh, to embed, of course, reconciliation and dealing with the past is not only a question uh, in Western Balkans. It's a question for all of us in Europe. And they, when you look on the, on the way how the countries in Western Europe are dealing with these questions. You have good examples, promising examples, but you also have bad examples. You also have a lot of deficits. Uh, uh, and 
uh, things which have to be changed in, in our Western societies. And I think if we can establish a European dialogue uh, about this question, so with citizens from the West, young citizens from, from the Western Balkans and young citizens from the countries of the European Union, it would be really a step forward because we can learn from each other um, and can things can make things better. And maybe it's also an important experience, especially for young people from the Western Balkans, that also not everything in the countries of Western Europe concerning this question is well done. Uh, there are a lot of blind uh, spaces and uh, uh, I just, I, I'm, I'm living in Berlin, uh, just to give you one example, this is how uh, Germany, for example, is dealing with colonial history. Mm -hmm. Just during these days, we had a, we had, we have this discussion in our medias. Well, we're not going into details now, but there are a lot of deficits and there's a lot of work to do still. Um, so this would be my three points. Uh, mm -hmm. Dealing, embed this discussion more also in the European context. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, then also uh, to have a clear political will and support. And there are other points, mm -hmm. medias, for example, the mm -hmm. pictures and medias, um, uh, which are very important. Uh, the question of education, mm -hmm. uh, of the school books. What is the picture in, which is given about the neighbor in the school books? It took a long, long time between France and Germany to have a common school book. Mm -hmm. um, of history, common history book. Um, now we have one, uh, but it took really a long time. So um, there are a lot of things also on the European, in the European cooperation to do. And uh, this would be at the moment my answer. Thanks, thanks a lot, Frank. I mean, I think a couple of things have emerged from this first round. I mean, first of all, of course, we all have observed that the lack of political will, at least in in, a, in you know in several uh, contexts in the region, and which which makes it very difficult. I think the other one, it's of course good to zoom out and to, uh, as Natasha says, to look at the whole, not just the Western Balkans, but all of the post-Yugoslav space and also all of Europe. That these are not uh, unique phenomena, but it's uh, you know the wars of the '90s are a specific. Uh, you know, uh, tragedy uh, which needs to be dealt with, but of course the larger questions of dealing with the past is a European issue, I mean a global one, but one which in Europe has not found one single patented recipe, but is, is work in progress. And I think one thing which Exona and Frank said, which is I think very important, is that it's not a project kind of activity. It's not one thing you do with a two-year project, but it's 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 a lifetime uh, endeavor in a certain way, and it never ends. And I think as Frank was saying, I mean, Germany coming to terms with its colonial history and genocide against the Herero people in Namibia is something which is happening now, a hundred years after it occurred. So these, these are not uh, these are not processes which end after 20 30 years and in fact as we've heard might only become possible 30 or 40 years after the events I mean, which doesn't mean one should wait but which certainly means that it's not something which uh, can be done with a timeline as exona mentioned um, i think uh, appropriately and with a deadline of, of, of the end point um now i mean in the in the second round maybe because i mean we've identified the problems in the region but i you know i would like to ask all of you a question about because First of all, what can be done to create political will? I mean, that's that's the big question because I mean, Natasha was hinting at something which the European Union could do is to say not just fund project, but actually um, make it a message that this is important uh, for the European Union in the region from leadership. But what else could be done to change this lack of political will? You know, how is it going to come about? Um, and the, the, the second question I would have for all of you is what can be done in the absence of political will? Because, you know, if we just wait for political will, then we might wait for a long time, right? I mean, or, and, and, and so the question is what can be done while we are waiting for the political will to, to, to emerge? And um, so I'll give a second round to all, all three of you. And I just want to remind all of the audience to ask your, start asking your questions in the Q&A already. It's, it's open and it, it allows me to feed into it. So please uh, raise your questions if you have them in the Q&A, or you can, of course, raise your hand as well. But uh, let's me first go for, for a second round and start with Exona again. Uh, well, 
I think I will I will I will make my my, my point in, in I will make my argument in, in three points. What Frank said is dealing with the past, political will, and and this education, which I I, I see as a as a really important um, really important uh, that could actually help. I think what we speak a lot about dealing with the past, but somehow I'm afraid that the 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 outcomes of the of the war and the conflicts on the on the 90s are still the the present in the region we have the situation of missing persons which is still an open wound for a lot of families in in the region something that was never dealt properly and which is still uh something that there's still a war going on in in those families and, and in those communities and we cannot speak about moving on where things from the past are actually not dealt properly. So we speak so much about dealing with the past, but I'm afraid that there is a lot of things that are are present even right now. Uh, we, uh, uh, Mrs. Natasha mentioned the, the situation of missing persons, and, and I'm afraid that this will continue if, if we don't deal with that properly. Uh, we have, uh, I think, uh, when when it comes to when it comes to the political will, unfortunately, I'm not really optimistic that political will will fix the situation in the region. Of course, they should be responsible and they should take responsibility. But as a young uh, girl living currently in in the region, I don't think that uh, with this political uh, elites going on, on on the region, we will have a lot to to move on. We have politics in the region who, who are genocide deniers. And you cannot speak about reconciliation if we have politicians uh, taking and making decisions for the future where they cannot actually accept what was going on in the region. So I think what we should do, uh, I think, um, uh, I think in, in that education would actually really help, but as well, as well, we have to be really care careful on that. What kind of education and how, how we're actually helping on that. I, I remember something, uh, we were talking with, uh, some, some friends some days ago. I was in primary school and, um, one of my teachers said something really funny for me. Uh, said we, I was in, in second grade or something like that, and she said we were speaking about learning uh, different languages, and uh, and she was saying that oh we should learn uh, Serbian as well because it's it's a it's the language of the enemy, and I grew up with that narrative, and I started working in a peace building and reconciliation project. One of my colleagues was a young girl coming from Serbia, which she was telling me that somehow this narrative was happening as well in her school. So, and then somehow we have to challenge these narratives that we have been learning in school, what happens actually on the ground. And, and I think as a society, not that we have so much to learn from each other, but we have so much more to unlearn because we have history books in the region who tell different facts. So if you if 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 from one country you have different history books that are telling you something different, you have as well different perspectives that are going on. And of course, you'd have clashes of opinions and perspectives of young people as well. So I think uh, what what we should do, I think in, I can speak, for example, in the situation of Kosovo, I have seen a lot the civil society working in, in, in that field. And I think young people, I can speak mostly about young people, are moving on to reconciliation way much more faster than the politics in, for example, in Kosovo are, are moving towards that. I have seen a lot of uh, politics when it comes to, uh, to, to reconciliation, but not a lot of humanity. And we are speaking about human lives here. So... Uh, I don't think exactly what what we should do, but I think if uh, I think we should we should aim for we should aim for more. Uh, we mentioned here convincing EU and, and and doing much more to 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 convincing European Union, Brussels, and all the internationals. But I think we should try to focus more on how we are convincing ourselves and what we are doing for ourselves. We should not make this process of reconciliation as an aim goal to join EU. We should start doing it because it's it's affecting our life, and 
not not this to become a, a gold so then later on we can we can join you if we're doing that i think that's not the 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 proper way to to address all the problems that we we have discussed here great thanks Exona. and that actually ties up with also with one of the the one of the questions which come up you know how much can we look you know how much is it useful to look outside the eu resolving the problems um which of course then also means that it's all linked with the EU accession process and not with, I mean, this has been criticized when it comes to multiple reforms over the last two decades. I mean, Natasha, you've mentioned the context of the ICTY, the ICTY conditionality was useful for governments to cooperate, but then governments only cooperated because it allowed them to move closer towards the European Union, not because they were committed to the substance of the ICTY. And we see, of course, once that conditionality disappears, so does the commitment and so a certain way can outsiders at all you know they can facilitate it but at the end of the day it has to come from within the society itself right so anyhow so let me turn to natasha to, to to have your take on on the, those questions of what to do in the absence of political will and how to help bring about this political will i will start uh, uh claiming that there are no political uh bill because uh, you know uh, 10 years ago, uh, when we, uh, civil society started to interact with initiative, uh, uh, we were faced with politicians who were very positive. Uh, they uh, publicly uh, promised that uh, they will do it everything to name the victims. And uh, uh, we had one politician from Croatia, the president of Croatia, Ivo Josipovic, who was uh, very honest uh, uh, with knowledge about uh, how it's important to name the victims to know what's happened to the people in the in the war but uh, uh, after him everything is uh, uh, changed uh, we were faced with politicians who started to uh, uh, to promote um, some other values to speak about uh, stability, security, that victims are known, all world know uh, uh, the victims. It's not so, uh, uh, so important at the moment, uh, other issues are important, but uh, 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 I cannot say that uh, uh, only politicians in the region are uh, responsible for this situation. Uh, European Union, European Commission's officials uh, uh, also share a responsibility. Many conferences uh, uh, were dedicated to the reconciliations with, uh, uh, with uh, European Commission officials uh, statement that reconciliation is our issue. Mm -hmm. That European Commission, European Union uh, cannot uh, deal with, uh, with uh, our, our uh, issue with reconciliation. Uh, you know, uh, it was wrong because uh, reconciliation is not only uh, our uh, our uh, our responsibility because uh, uh, we saw that uh, public support uh, for regional reconciliation is not enough to convince politicians in the region and to change European Union officials uh, their opinion uh, towards the reconciliation. It means that. Uh, uh, it, uh, re reconciliation should become uh, our uh, our uh, our uh, our very important uh, priority because uh, uh, post Yugoslav uh, space is so important uh, not only for Europe for other countries to show how it's important uh, you know to deal in post conflict times. Uh, as um, I will repeat, the first step is to oblige all post Yugoslav leaders to work together with civil society to name the victims and to solve the issue of missing persons. It is the priority because after 30 years, I am tracking information about the missing persons, the Record Reconciliation Network came to, to the con conclusion that nobody, including international organization, domestic uh, institution, commission for missing persons, nobody seriously worked on that issue. On the list of uh, ICRC, we have the names of people 
who are not the uh, war victims, but, but also there are no names of real victims on, uh, on the, some, some names, some missing persons are not uh, registered on the uh, ICRC list because there are no family to, uh, to apply for their uh, missing. Now, uh, Reckon Reconciliation Net uh, Network will uh, show in the future months uh, uh, everything relating the missing persons uh, uh, relating the uh, war in Kosovo and show how it is possible to solve uh, the issue uh, uh, and to, you know, to show that uh, what's happened with uh, that issue. Uh, I, will, um, I will mention only uh, Serbia. Serbia were not, uh, uh, was not interested to uh, to be more active in issue of missing persons because uh, to discover a mass location, it was very dangerous. If um, Serbia discover mass graves, it will, it will be clear who is responsible for mass graves. But also Kosovo is not innocent in that because everything, uh, every discussion about the missing persons uh, in Kosovo uh, came to the conclusion that the international community was in charge, uh, that uh, domestic institution, uh, they don't have information, but it's not, not, not the truth. But now it's time to find a way how to oblige post-Yugoslav countries, post-Yugoslav leaders to do something uh, what will be important uh, uh, for reconciliation and for uh, good relations to oblige them to name the victims, to work with the civil society and include academic institution in the research uh, uh, activities because now it's time for uh, data uh, promotion, uh, court uh, fact promotion and data collection. Without that, we cannot speak about uh, education, the new curriculum, to speak about how uh, to build the uh, confidence. If we don't uh, know the names of victims, and if we uh, uh, don't respect and don't implement uh, evidence uh, and facts established by international courts. Mm. Thanks, thanks, Natasha. Frank, uh, your take on this question. Yes, uh, I would just take what Natasha Kandish just said. It's uh, do I have an access? I, I would like to, to start maybe with your second question. What can, can be done in the absence of some mm. political will? Because more is your answer. Um, first, we have really an access to the to data and to facts uh, uh, and to support the academic institutions who are working on this. Um, the, it's a, I mean, it's an old experience from all over Europe that you can arrest history for your national interests or for your pol political interests. And uh, to have access to data and to have access to facts, especially for young people, is a very, very important point. So this is one thing. The second thing is, um, I think it's, it's a very, I'm, the Franco-German Youth Office uh, exchanged since 1963, nine million, around nine million young people between France and Germany. That means nine million individuals who had the opportunity, at least during one or two weeks, to meet the neighbor, to discuss issues, and to have a personal experience. I remember when I was eight years old, my father, who was a soldier in the Second World War, uh, sent me to France and he said, I don't, I mean, I was not interested to go to France. I wanted to have my holidays in Germany, but he said, my son, you, are, you have to go to France and you have to learn the language of your neighbor and you have to understand and to develop a respect for this culture. And years later, I understood that this was really a huge gift from my father, a huge present a gift. And uh, um, so to give young people opportunities to exchange and to, 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 to go to, to the other country and to have a dialogue with other young people about these questions, about all these questions, also to face history and uh, not just to follow what they see in the medias, to follow very often the hate speeches in the, also from the, from, from, from the political level, 
but to to create their own opinion, their own uh, their own, and to collect their own experience. Uh, I think this is a really a very very important thing. And here, Raiko, for example, is really doing a very important has a very important task and, and challenge uh, to establish. Uh, and we should not also forget that the creation of Raiko somehow is also a political will from the, all the Western Balkan six governments to create such an institution. So we have to bring that forward. Um, when it comes to uh, when it comes to the question, what can be done to create political will? Um, I think one way there are, there are a lot of answers. It's not an easy question, but one one idea is also to strengthen the dialogue between civil society and especially young people and politicians. I remember a project we had with young people from uh, from Kosovo and young people with from Serbia. We went together in the Serbian Parliament and we had a discussion with with politicians there, and then we went with the same group to Pristina and we had a discussion in the Parliament there with politicians also. So I think it's very it's uh, very important to bring together citizens with politicians and to to make here pressure and to uh, and to and to create dialogue uh, um, um, uh, to strengthen this dialogue um, to make also that politicians um, understand why it's in their interest to to deal with the reconciliation and to uh, and to strengthen the dialogue, uh, not only in the region but also with uh, with the European level. Thanks. So I take from 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 all of your answers. I mean, a couple of key points which emerge. I mean, one of them is a, is that of course external pressure still matters. It's not irrelevant anymore. The question is just what how it's done, as Natasha was saying, and what its focus is on. When it comes to when it comes to um, you know the kind of I think key observations is what could be done is one is that of course youth exchange can happen and it does happen and governments seem to be willing to engage in that so that's something to to work with um and then i think the other point which natasha and frank you've mentioned both is the idea that you know researching i mean documenting um, what happened is very important and it's a research activity in many ways and maybe we often this is the project thinking of, of, of work and reconciliation is that it focus, focuses only on the end result but rather to say one needs to actually create first the research communities in the region which have established a, you know which established a track record of interpreting the past scientifically academically which then trickles down in public debate which then trickles down in textbooks um, you know, if you think about the debate in Germany or so on, it was historians who wrote, rewrote or wrote the history of the Holocaust and war crimes, and then that trickled into public debates, into school books, uh, textbooks, and so on. And I think sometimes with a project for, you know, two year timeline, one says we have to have the public debate and the convince, convincing people uh, in two years, rather than saying, well, first we need the historians to, to write the histories, which are not nationalist histories, but which are evidence-based, uh, you know, a top scholarship of the wars in the region. And then this can inform knowledge base across the societies. And then this trickles down to textbooks, media, and so on. So in a certain way, this impatience sometimes leads to under-investing maybe some of the important uh, initiatives. Um, and I wanna uh, bring in a few questions. I mean, one question which has come up in different ways is how much should we broaden the question of dealing with the past um, beyond the wars of the 90s. I mean, one person mentioned uh, Roma as a, a, the group which has been the most widely discriminated in the region. And the other one mentioned crimes, uh, in particular in the case of Albania, uh, of uh, during the totalitarian rule, communist rule. So which degree does one also need to deal with those particular questions rather than just the wars of the 1990s? So that's a, one question uh, which I would bring together and then um, we, I see also that uh, Syracuse Breutigam has a question. So I would ask um, uh, him to also raise his question with us so we can also have uh, a, live, a live question here. And of course, I invite others to do the same. And then we can have a round of answers. I think you could talk now. Ah, Hopefully okay. Yes, and we can also see you, hopefully. I don't know if we can see you as well, but at least we can hear you for what any difficulties. Uh, 
Well, hello to everyone. I don't know if you can see me, but um, you can hear me, so that's good enough for me. Um, I'm actually from the Robert Bosch Foundation, so I would like to ask a question from the donor's perspective, so to say, because we see there's a certain fatigue also from EU European juniors uh, in engaging in the Western Balkans. However, against all the odds, there are still some institutions that are committed <laughs> to promote peace building. So my question would be, um, yeah, what are you recommending based on your experience, which is very broad from the last years? Um, what attitudes or strategies should a donor organization apply in shaping a political narrative that is positive and creating political will? Thank you. Another one of the easy questions. Um, so um, I, I take that question for all of you, as well as the question of whether to broaden in a certain way the question of dealing with the past beyond that. Um, and then I think there, there, there are further uh, questions also in the in the Q and A. One of them is, um, you know, relating again to the external actors. I mean, there was a, a reference to the PRESPA agreement. To which degree is, you know, when you have this effort of a government to deal with open questions with neighbors, uh, with Greece and with Bulgaria, and then in the end you're still stuck in the EU process. What to do about that? Isn't that discouraging for 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 dealing with these sensitive questions because there's no no reward? Um, but that's more of an observation than a, than a, than a question. Um, and then I'm I'm tempted. To to take one more question before I give to the panelists, because I see Thomas Osorio who has a, a question. So maybe he can also pose his question. Yes, uh, uh, thank you very much, Glenn. Um, I, I hope you can see me, I'm not really sure, but I think- We can uh, hear you perfectly, thank you. And I think Natasha uh, said it in a single word, uh, oblige. I think uh, we, cannot, uh, we cannot continue to wait for the onset of some some political will to somehow magically appear. I think that, you know, as we demand from our families, our neighbors, uh, a certain conduct, I, I think we need to demand conduct that represents a, a, a level of civilization in which we live. Um, and, and I'm not only speaking, you know, from certain organizations, the EU or the UN or international organizations, but, you know, how long can we continue to support partners that deliberately flaunt the rule of law uh, ridicule the dignity of, of its citizens, not only those of the past, but those of those of today. While at the same time, we reward this through um, political friendships, through financial means. Uh, and I think the, the key here is obligations such as conditionality. I don't think that, con that conditionality is a, is, a, is a term or a tool that has been exhausted or, or somehow is, is, is no longer valid. I think that you know it, it allows us to set the bar. It allows us to set the standard and set those conditions for which we will continue our friendship or or our, our engagement. So mm -hmm. concretely, I think I think you know uh, what can we do to help set that bar and those standards, and that those standards belong to a, a broader uh, implementing audience, such as the European Union, the United States, mm -hmm. the. Um, the UN all, and all organizations, you know, so what is that bar? And also we need to start listening again to the monitors, mm -hmm. to, the, to civil society and individuals who actually have something to say and that their message is heard. I mean, just recently, uh, a report from the Humanitarian uh, Law Center regarding the independence of the judiciary, uh, uh, regarding war crimes and others, totally disregarded. Now, today, we have, a new, we have new information about, uh, that's coming out about the independence of the judiciary, fine, but not enough examples are in those reports that we as citizens can make uh, uh, our own judgments of where we need to go. So those are the two things. What can we do to help set that bar? And how can we, how can we uh, encourage that monitors and civil society and others are, are, are heard again, um, as, as, we, as we know was in the past? Thank you. Thanks. So um, difficult questions. Um, maybe we do a reverse order this time around and we'll start with uh, Frank for his take on, you can pick out any of the questions we've, we've uh, raised. I would like to come back on the first question uh, of my colleague from Robert Bosch Foundation uh, when it comes to uh, recommending uh, 
um, our strategy, how to, to, to deal with this. I think it's important to support, uh, to support really uh, this uh, dealing, uh, projects about dealing with the past. Uh, to support the, especially the young people. Um, sorry to say that again and again, but it's not only because I'm working for Franco German Youth Office, but also uh, because I believe this is the work that the young generation has to take more and more responsibility. And it's, it's very important uh, not only to name in official speeches and official declarations that the young generation is important, but to give them also a political weight that, I mean, uh, to say young people is important is easy, but to share power with them is another is a completely other thing. And I think it's very, very important uh, to, um, to work with young people. And my experience, by the way, uh, with, in the work with French, German, and, and uh, young people from the Western Balkans is that they are very, very interested. They are really, they want to take this responsibility and they, 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 are, they are looking and they are asking for that. And I think it's very important uh, to bring them also together in a dialogue with politicians uh, um, to give the opportunity, give them the opportunity to um, to create their own their own image, their own experiences about the neighbor. And I say it again: to embed this dialogue and to embed this question of reconciliation in the European context. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Natasha. I think um, uh, uh, now is uh, uh, need to, uh, to work on different sides, but uh, uh, without, um, without the European Commission and other European Union bodies, uh, uh, it's impossible to think that we, uh, that, uh, we are able I think on people uh, from post-Yugoslav countries to make any progress relating the reconciliation because every, politicians are divided, uh, uh, memory activities are uh, divided uh, without uh, without some obligation is, uh, issued by uh, European uh, Commission. It's impossible uh, to start in different way. For example, uh, uh, whole region, uh, um, uh, whole region uh, witnessed uh, uh, last week uh, uh, what uh, what, what uh, came from uh, France and Germany relating the reconciliation and the past. It was without any political reaction. Mm. Uh, uh, we had in a region uh, uh, completely different uh, uh, activities. Croatia president said something. What is uh, what was a very, uh, a very strange that uh, his uh, public statement was against the victims. Uh, and many other politi uh, statement, political statements uh, uh, were contrary to France and Germany approach. Uh, we need to see France and Germany with their experience uh, to, uh, to, uh, to bring more their experience to the region. And uh, uh, what is also important now, uh, they're present in the region that, uh, but not only in the region, also in uh, Europe, that criminal, uh, criminal uh, justice is not so important. You know, nothing is possible to do it for the future without, without legacy of ICTY. It's so important this, uh, uh, without that, uh, we cannot uh, think that we, could build confidence that we uh, uh, that we are able to uh, reach good uh, relation as uh, neighbors. Criminal justice is very important, and now is uh, uh, time to make pressure, especially on Serbia and Croatia, uh, and you know part of uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Republika Srpska, uh, openly uh, their politicians say that uh, they will not. Uh, participate in reconciliation based on ICTY facts. And it, it was without reaction in Europe. And how to, how to speak about reconciliation without ICTY evidence and facts? 
Now is uh, so important to promote, I, I will repeat, to promote court facts, international, uh, uh, ISTY court facts, research facts, historical facts. And you know, to try to make a connectivity between uh, civil society institution and academic institution. Uh, uh, now, uh, it is uh, data collection, data promotion is our only weapon with, against the manipulation and against politicians who are not reliable relating to reconciliation. Mm. So, Thanks, Tatasha. Exona. Uh, well, there, there, there were a lot of remarks that were, were discussed here. Uh, I think what uh, what we talked here is is this dealing with the past and the fact of history. I'm afraid that especially the the societies in the region are learning a lot about history from politicians more than from historians, which I think this is affecting a lot of the narratives that is going on on the region, and it's affecting the way how how future generations are thinking as well. Uh, we mentioned here the the facts that we should we should talk about we should approach to a better future with facts but when you have different groups in the region that they are looking at facts differently then you have an, it's 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 a vicious circle problems that i think we uh, we need to take them if we take them one by one can take time but if we take them all together somehow can lead to another problem we mentioned here exchanges, uh, talking, uh, bringing youth together, but uh, we we can speak that for certain countries in the region. If we speak about a young uh, citizen, citizen from, from Kosovo or someone coming from Bosnia and Herzegovina, they cannot actually meet together at all. They need to find a mutual ground where they can meet in the region or in, in, in EU so they can they can talk together. So we are speaking a lot, we are speaking about exchanging, bringing them together, but then on when it comes to, to making that happen, you face other problems. So it's really hard to speak on dealing with the past when you have a lot of obstacles, even technically and politically one, which are not letting that happen. And then, of course, when you have when, as we talked here about, we need to, to, to deal with facts and then approach on, on a better future. Of course, that is that is something uh, something that we can talk uh, demanding from from civil society. I think uh, I think uh, civil society is actually doing a lot when it comes to to reconciliation, way much more than politicians are doing. We have talked here that there is a lack of political will. I think civil society has played a, a really uh, pivotal role when it comes to, to keeping the society together, but that is not enough. If you don't have responsibility coming from, from the political level, then I think uh, of course, it's 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 important, but regardless what what is happening in in a grassroots level, in society level, you need a political you need a political uh, political will and and responsibility when it comes to uh, when it comes to that. And uh, I for me uh, we we talked about here early, but uh, for me when I was looking more into, for example, the dialogue that was going, for example, between Kosovo and 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 Serbia. Uh, for me, it was really a, a dialogue without principles, and 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 we, there was so much political driving force and so much ethnically driving force that for me it was really sad to see in 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 that in that level. Uh, so I don't. Um, I think there, as as Frank said, there is not only one one way, but I think. Uh, we need more more uh, civil society to demand from politicians, and then maybe we can. It's not the only one way solution, let's say. Thanks, Alexona. Uh, unfortunately, our time is up. Uh, I think we've noticed, and I think there were some more questions which were also expressing the frustration with the lack of political will among most elites in the region who have no incentive and currently no 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 reason to really move this process forward. And I think this is the big conclusion. Things can be done um, in terms of documenting, researching, and creating these, uh, countering those revisionist uh, histories, which Natasha has pointed out. 
Um, it's a long-term process, something which I think Frank and Exona have mentioned in terms of that this is not a, a project which will end. It's something which will continue for decades and hopefully outlive all of those politicians and their efforts, um, as well as um, as well as the issue that the EU is not uh, off the hook, um, that it ha has to put pressure on dealing with those issues and has to take them seriously. It has to come from within society, but with the current political elites, it's unlikely to go forward. So. Again, there are more questions and there are more challenges, and we don't and can't answer them today. Um, but uh, hopefully, it was useful for everybody. And I would like to thank Exona, Natasha, and Frank for their thoughtful comments and reflections, um, and all of you for asking your questions. And uh, with this, I'm concluding the session for now and see you at some of the other events of the forum. All the best.